Thank you, Dr. Utel. And uh, thank you to the committee for the invitation. I appreciate being here today. Um, so I'm going to talk today about a specific study, one VA pilot study that was awarded uh, to me early on a few years ago. Um, I have no disclosures to report, uh, and the views expressed today are my own. Uh, I wanted to first kind of start with, in case anyone's unfamiliar with the VA mechanism of a VA pilot award, uh, really the goal here is to establish feasibility to develop data uh, and really kind of generate preliminary data in support of a larger proposal or a larger application. So I, I just kind of wanted to frame that with uh, the, the results that I'll provide today. They're limited in scope. Um, so this is uh, supported by the VA through uh, the Rehabilitation Research and Development Service, and it was a two-year observational cross-sectional study. You know, uh, just a little bit more background on this. I was actually just talking to Dr. Schneiderman about our kind of foray into this topic. Uh, I in initially wrote this proposal in 2011 as a postdoctoral fellow, and this really was born out of, um, at that time, I would say, really scant literature on published objective findings uh, in deployed service members. We knew there was certainly an increase in respiratory symptoms. There was a lot of concern. Uh, so our goal really here was to see if there was a signal behind some of those symptoms. So the, the study design in and of itself is relatively simple and straightforward. At that time, we thought it would be important if we identified a group of OEF, OIF veterans that were deployed and compared that to a group that was non-deployed, um, also dealing with uh, non-deployed veterans. We proposed a small study 25 individuals per group, and we really wanted to capture two primary things, some objective data on cardiopulmonary function. Um, we spoke in the grant specifically about looking really only at spirometry and exercise testing. You see some blue font down here, and I'm sorry if you can't see that in the back, uh, but these are the things that we added into the study that were not part of the initial grant, but things that we wanted to generate some preliminary data on. So we included a bronchodilator challenge, we included diffusing capacity, uh, and a technique called force oscillation uh, to get a better assessment of the distal or smaller airways. Uh, we also had a uh, visit too that included some autonomic physiology. I'm not going to talk too much about this today because I know the committee is, is geared specifically for investigating respiratory health, but I'll, I'll comment on that briefly. And, and really we're looking there at uh, some simple measures of heart rate variability. Uh, we do a test called cerebrovascular reactivity to look at vessels in the brain. Uh, we added to that uh, a couple blood, uh, a blood sample and as well as a peripheral measure of vascular reactivity using flow media dilation of the uh, brachial artery. So that's the, the general design. So the first thing, I'll start with some demographics, and let me draw your attention to the top here, just kind of the, our, our group. So originally we, we proposed we would do 25 per group. We had an uh, excellent response and interest from the broader community, and that's where we recruited, uh, those that were around VA New Jersey. Um, so we recruited into the community of veterans that might be interested in participating or volunteering for this study. After about a year into the study, I realized I could not find non-deployed veterans uh, in that greater area to recruit in. And so unfortunately at that time, I, I had to uh, broaden it. So 13 of that group were actually civilians. So I wanted to make that point early on uh, and comment to, I think, a committee committee member brought up some questions about um, recruitment earlier. So non-deployed veterans were increasingly challenging for us to identify and still remain so today. So our two groups that uh, I'll draw some quick comparisons to are our deployed veterans uh, and our non-deployed group. Uh, relatively well matched in terms of sex, uh, age, and body fat percentage. Former, uh, former smokers were allowed to in participate in the study. Current smokers were excluded. Our pack years are relatively low and similar between group. Uh, on average, the total cumulative deployment length to Iraq and Afghanistan was around 16 months. And at the time of the visit, they're about six and a half years removed from service in Iraq and or Afghanistan. Um, we did a variety of questionnaires, but I'll just report the St. George Respiratory Questionnaire uh, on the bottom here, this total percentage. Um, to look a little bit at proof of concept, did this deployed veteran group uh, endorse respiratory symptoms? And as expected, we see kind of a higher amount there, kind of consistent. So in terms of exclusions else to this group, um, any existing uh, pre-military pre -military history of lung disease or current lung disease individuals were recruited by self-report and by CPRS medical record review. Uh, individuals that had contraindications to exercise testing who were pregnant were also excluded. Um, major organ disease. So uh, that was probably the, the, our, our group here. And again, these are recruited in the community within our center. <clears throat> 
So the first group of kind of primary outcomes that we'll mention are related to cardiopulmonary exercise testing. Uh, just to orient you for the next few slides, I'll have the variables here uh, listed on the far left side of the screen, uh, our two groups, and then a measure of effect size. Uh, so for VO2 peak or exercise capacity, we found it to be very similar between deployed and non-deployed groups. We found our ventilatory anaerobic threshold uh, was relatively similar and in a normal range between those two groups. Uh, we, I pulled out a, a measure here of ventilatory efficiency, uh, VE, VCO2 slope. Uh, that was within normal limits and again similar between group. Um, and I also took a look at this variable here that extracted uh, the peak ventilation divided by the maximal voluntary ventilation, or VE over MVV, which is a common traditional measure uh, that's used to identify ventilatory limitation to exercise during exercise testing. Usually we propose a cutoff value there around 0 0.8, where values there or above would be indicative of a ventilatory limitation to exercise. And so you see in our group here, despite having similar levels of exercise capacity, our deployed individuals tended to have a higher VE over MVV ratio uh, in a range that was considered abnormal. And that effect size is a moderate effect size that we observed between groups there. Uh, and then lastly, we pulled the Borg breathlessness scale uh, from their uh, exercise testing. This was ascertained at peak exercise. Uh, we saw a rather large effect size between groups there, such that the deployed veterans were reporting a higher level of breathlessness during exercise. And just for frame of reference, a value of five is indicative of severe breathlessness during exercise. That's a zero to 10 scale. In terms of pulmonary function, uh, I pulled out a couple of just selected variables here. Uh, first, uh, three different rows there, reflective of spirometry. These are represented as a percent of predicted value. You see that on the right-hand side of the screen, our effect sizes are rather large there, from moderate to large, from 0.6 to 0.9 such that the spirometry was lower in individuals that were deployed. But importantly, as we've probably the committee have seen before and we've reported previously, still falling largely within normal limits. Um, in terms of diffusing capacity or DLCO as represented as percent predicted, we found no differences there between groups. Uh, and with a bronchodilator response, again, similar between those that were deployed and non-deployed in this sample. Now, I'll, I'll go through this uh, quickly because these are some of the autonomic measures that I know are maybe a little outside of the purview of, of this committee right now. Um, but just to highlight a couple things, um, this top row is heart rate recovery following exercise. Um, usually gives us an indication of sympathetic withdrawal and, um, and parasympathetic uh, reactivation, such that a faster heart rate recovery post-exercise is generally considered a very good thing, and a slower heart rate recovery post-exercise uh, or a delayed recovery is uh, sometimes prognostic. So we saw a large effect size there, a moderate uh, to large effect size between groups such that the deployed veterans had a blunted heart rate recovery post-exercise. For some of our time-based measures of heart rate variability here, we saw really no difference between group. Um, in a frequency-based measure of heart rate variability, we saw a moderate effect size between groups. Um, and with respiratory sinus arrhythmia, or RSA, as represented down here, we saw a lower uh, RSA in our veterans, the deployed veterans, in comparison to non-deployed. Uh, and then lastly, we did this measure that's called cerebrovascular reactivity test, where individuals are presented with a higher concentration of CO2 that they inhale, and we look for changes in cerebral blood flow. Uh, we didn't really see major changes between groups on that measure as well. So uh, those were the... Um, just selected variables are some of our primary outcomes from that first uh, initial study. Uh, the committee asked me to kind of talk a little bit more about you know, where those studies led to and, and where we're at now, so I just wanted to introduce that for the panel and to the group. So one thing I didn't measure earlier that was kind of a, an add-on to that study is that we added in a technique called the force oscillation technique, uh, FOT, sometimes used synonymously with uh, impulse oscillometry, if you're more familiar with that. Um, where again, this test has shown some potential to distinguish uh, distal airway function a little bit more sensitively than uh, spirometry. And we saw just very generally that our deployed group, despite having preserved spirometry, tended to have elevated measures of resistance and reduced uh, measures of reactance, um, suggestive of some evidence of perhaps small airway dysfunction. 
Now, one of the nice parts about working at the risk is that we also have a large clinical program as well. So uh, that allowed us to look at those data uh, separate from this VA pilot study. So now on the right-hand side of the screen here, we're looking at our clinical data. And so we published this report that came out earlier this year that uh, showed in our clinical sample that despite having preserved spirometry, uh, about three and four of our veterans uh, demonstrated small airway dysfunction uh, using that measure of FOT. Uh, Dr. Helmer is going to talk a little bit more about the risk and our scope a little bit later on, so I, I won't go into too much detail there, but wanted to distinguish the difference between the VA pilot ward and then the, the larger study of our, our clinical sample. Much in the same vein, um, although I mentioned there was no group differences in terms of diffusing capacity in our uh, VA pilot study, as represented by this scatter plot here, we were particularly interested and concerned about uh, a small group of these veterans that presented with an isolated reduction in DLCO, which is a relatively rare presentation in the, in the face of normal spirometry and normal volumes. And about 36% of that group had reduced or an isolated reduction in DLCO. So that certainly prompted my interest and our group's interest to explore whether that pattern persisted in our larger clinical sample. And so we, we published this paper that came out uh, in 2016, where about 30% of our clinical sample demonstrate this pattern of an isolated reduction in DLCO. That was actually the most common abnormality that we see in our clinic, and that uh, presentation persists today. So that really has sparked kind of our, our recent and our, our current VA Merit Award, where we've tried to investigate that pattern specifically. Um, so again, dealing with um, in response to what we observed in the VA Pilot Award for this small group of individuals, well, 36% of that, the deployed veterans that had that isolated reduction in DLCO is represented down here, we also did some additional measures. Again, this was the purpose of the VA Pilot, is to generate some preliminary data. So we took a, um, a blood marker, and one of the things that we looked at was circulating endothelium-1, uh, potent vasoconstrictor, um, known for maintaining vascular homeostasis. And we looked at that measure uh, of ET1, as represented in the y-axis here, in individuals with low DLCO versus normal DLCO. And I'm sorry that my figure legend didn't come out here. Uh, but what we found that individuals with lower DLCO had higher levels of ET1, or endothelium-1. We also took a look at a peripheral measure of vascular reactivity, the flow meter dilation of the brachial artery. On the y-axis here, uh, we're representing this as the flow mediated, flow mediated dilation uh, normalized to shear rate, which is kind of the current recommendation as to how to do this, and looked at those individuals in our group with uh, normal DLCO versus low DLCO, and you see a very attenuated response in that flow mediated dilation. So again, Small, uh, small sample here, all of this data was generated from the VA pilot study, but really served as the foundation for what we wanted to explore next. So currently underway, uh, we're investigating this in much broader detail in this VA Merit Award. We're about one year into that study right now, uh, and that's supported by uh, VA CSR&D. So with that, I just want to acknowledge uh, all the folks that uh, helped contribute to this VA pilot award, our colleagues in VA post-deployment health services, uh, leadership at the risk and the Airborne Hazards Burn Pit Center of Excellence. And I think lastly, just some references of where we presented some of this data to date. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you um, uh, very much. Uh, questions for Dr. Falbo? In, um, in your clinical study, uh, which I gather was not really part of the pilot, um, it looked like the oscillometrics and uh, your DLCO were different, were, 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 were lower. What percentage of that group were smokers? So uh, I want to say the, the number of former smokers are, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head. Uh, I'd have to pull up that study. The former smokers, I want to say, is about 30%, I mean, around 28% if I remember correctly. Was it different than, than it was in, in your populations uh, that were recruited for the, uh, for the pilot studies? Slightly, slightly higher in the clinical sample. Uh, other questions? How, how big is the study that you're planning now? So the study right now is in uh, 
is designed around looking at two particular PFT patterns. Uh, one group would have normal pulmonary function test and normal diffusing capacity. And another group would have normal pulmonary function test but an isolated reduction in DLCO. In order to get at those two groups, uh, we predict that we will have to do some preliminary testing on around 200 individuals. And we're powered to detect, um, based on our, our power calculation, 40, uh, 45 individuals between each group. So it'd be 90 that would participate in follow-up testing. Just out of curiosity, what percent predicted do you use as an abnormal diffusing capacity? For example, uh, in Rochester, we use plus minus 40 percent, which some would argue is, is correct or incorrect, but uh, are you using plus minus 20 percent for an abnormal DL? No, sir. Sorry, I should have clarified. Uh, we're using the, the Miller equations, and we look at the lower limit of normal, and they're corrected for hemoglobin. But it looked like that was 80 percent of predicted. I did that as kind of a, a visual way, because it's hard for me to graphically do that on on the slide here. Yes, that's what sort of raises flags for us. Right. I apologize. Right. It's still, as, you, as you're saying, it's, a, it's the 80% predicted. So that well, it wouldn't be 80%. Uh, what we use is the, the lower fifth percentile, the lower limit of normal for the using the Miller equations. I, and so sorry, yes, I, I put in the 80% as just kind of a, a visual guide there to, to represent the data. One other question. You alluded to blood tests of autonomic function. Uh, that wasn't the endothelin one you were you were alluding to then. Are there are there other blood tests that you're thinking about that reflect autonomic function? Uh, sorry, uh, no. So we looked at blood markers. Then we also separately looked at measures of physiological autonomic function. And so the blood markers were not designed to look at autonomic function. Thank you.